uh, well dear friends uh, welcome back once again uh, to the program of uh, asha and ganga jamni heritage as all of you know that we are uh, hosting one historian or the other uh, on each of the sunday and what we are discussing is the shared past which we had in our history uh today uh, we are going to have someone uh, who uh, doesn't need any introduction at all today we are going to discuss the recent publication uh, of uh, professor richard eaton which is entitled as india in the persianate age uh, Uh, 1000 to 1765 AD. As all of you know, that Professor uh, Richard Eaton is a professor of history at the University of Arizona. He has published a number of groundbreaking books on the, uh, you know, uh, history of India, uh, dating back to uh, uh, before 1800. and these include a number of major works on the social role of the sufis slavery uh, uh, you know the growth of muslim societies bengal eastern frontiers uh, the deccan so on and so forth uh, amongst his books there are four or five which i think that most of these students of history must have consulted at least once in their lifetime the sufis of bijapur in 1978 firozabad palace city of the deccan it's an important uh, work which uh, professor eaton did along with george michel in 1992 one of the most uh, you know in, uh, famous books of uh, professor eaton is rise of islam and bengal frontier which came out in 1993 another book which came out in uh, year 2000 was essays on islam and indian history these are brilliant works uh, and then ultimately there is a book which unfortunately uh, is not very uh, well known as far as the uh, students in india are concerned uh, and that is a publication which took place in 2014 which professor eaton did along with wagner and this was par memory architecture contested sites in uh, india's deccan plateau 1300 to 1600 a very interesting work indeed uh, fortunately i have uh, uh, the book with me and Uh, it's a remarkable book which i think every student of history should consult however having said all that there is yet another work of professor eaton which has influenced at least me a lot and i think that uh, a large number of uh, indian uh, you know uh, uh, students of history uh, are also aware of it and this work was actually written in the form of a uh, of an article which was published uh, in the front line around december 2000 and that was on the temple desecration and muslim states in medieval india uh, uh, and then ultimately in 2019 the work which we are going to discuss today with professor eaton uh, uh, the persianate age 1000 to 1765 came out uh, i must also inform all those uh, uh, who are uh, tuned into this program that this particular book has been shortlisted for the kandel uh, history prize long list for 2020 and i hope and i wish that professor eaton would ultimately uh, win uh, the, this uh, uh, particular prize uh, it is uh, surely one of the best textbooks which is based on the original primary sources which will uh, uh, give the reader much general information about 
the medieval uh, history or medieval period in India. I must say that the age of this book over other such other texts which have been published is that Eden's work uh, includes the history of the Deccan Sultanates as well. It is not confined only to Delhi Sultanate and to the Mughals. Uh, in fact, these days, uh, uh, I mean, during my, uh, the period when I was the student, there were another set of books which were very important for us to consult. But these days, I think that if someone has to grasp medieval India, then there are at least uh, three or four uh, books or works which one has to consult. For example, uh, the uh, uh, medieval India, very uh, small uh, uh, textbook uh, published by the NBT, written by Irfan Habib. Uh, recently, just uh, last year, a book, the Delhi Sultanate, uh, the, the Sultanate of Delhi, uh, 1206 to 1526, uh, written by uh, Professor, uh, late Professor Anirudh Ray. These two books, along with that of uh, Professor Eaton, which we are going to discuss, I think are a must for any student who wants to understand what medieval India is all about. The another one of the other books which uh, I would recommend to the students is the work which came out a little earlier. Cynthia Talbot and Catherine Asher's India Before Europe. Uh, this is also a book which uh, gives you much information as far as uh, you know the 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 art and culture uh, uh, of the period is concerned. And together, if you read all these books, uh, all these four books, uh, I think a very rounded information about about medieval Indian history can be gained. Uh, by the students. Uh, let me impress that if you read these books, you would realize that the earlier works, for example, the comprehensive history of India, uh, Habib and Nizami and others, which were very popular, they only stress about the political aspects, or for that matter, there are books which stress only on the economic aspects of our past. But if you read all these books, four books together, you would be fortunate enough to know much about not only the politics, but also the society and culture as it was developing during the medieval period. So I think that uh, the work of Professor Eaton, uh, if read along with these books, would go a long, long way to, to establish uh, a student as a person who can talk about medieval Indian history. Let me not talk about this particular book which we are going to discuss today. There are many aspects, many firsts, which have been you know, uh, done by uh, Professor Eaton in this, but we would be discussing those after uh, uh, Professor Eaton has in fact spoken about them. And then if there is uh, some need, we would go uh, into some sort of a discussion uh, uh, with him. Uh, on those aspects. With these few words and without explaining much about the book, uh, let me invite Professor Eaton uh, to initiate his talk and tell us about uh, the work which is so important for the students of history today. Professor Eaton. Well, uh, thank you so very much, Professor Rezavi, for that very generous introduction. Uh, I want to extend my gratitude to not only you, but all the folks at, at Aligarh Muslim University uh, and the project that you are, you are uh, supporting with these series of lectures. I think this is a great idea, especially in this period of, uh, of COVID-19 when it's so very difficult for, for any of us to go anywhere. And, and so this technology has, has made this possible. I think this is a, one of the few advantages of, of, of living in this age. Uh, if there are any at all. Um, so, yes, uh, this book, India in the in the Persian at Age, 1000 to 1765, this was a book that I was commissioned to write by Penguin Books UK. They asked me to write uh, basically a textbook, 
covering what they called the middle period of, of uh, Indian history. And uh, so I did that. I was told that uh, Professor Romola Tupper had already written the, the kind of first volume, as it were, of this project uh, with, with her own book, which took went up to about 1300. And I was assigned to continue the narrative uh, down to the, the, the British colonial period. Um, so I, I drafted the manuscript. And when I was almost finished with the book, uh, I went to a dinner party, a colleague of mine who teaches anthropology at this university. And after the dinner, his wife asked me a very simple, innocent question. She was making conversation. She said, uh, well, Dick, what is the argument of your book? Well, <laughs> I did not know how to answer that question because I was not aware that my book had an argument. Uh, I, th I thought this was a textbook and textbooks usually do not have arguments. Usually don't, they don't even have a conclusion. Uh, they simply narrate a, a sequence of events from beginning to end and stop. Uh, but I was not satisfied with that idea of not having an argument. So I came home and I thought about it and I said, no, actually I do have an argument. Uh, and it's a very important argument. And, uh, and the argument basically was that the period that is this long contentious period, which is conventionally called the Muslim period, uh, really has a lot of problems. And even though I wrote two monographs and several edited volumes about Islam and the rise of Islam uh, and conversion to Islam in, in various parts of South Asia, um, I decided that, you know, maybe I need to look at this whole issue from a different perspective. And another reason why I, I was searching for a, an alternative way of, of looking at this period was obviously because of the politics of the past, uh, well, really the last 15 or 20 years, uh, especially in, in the current era with the BJP Raj in, in Delhi. Uh, uh, as we all know, Indian history has become dangerously politicized uh, with uh, much of the Indian, the middle period, the medieval period, uh, uh, dismissed uh, even as a period of slavery. Uh, I cite this uh, statement given by Prime Minister Modi in 2014, referring to this period that my book is covering as 1,200 years of slavery. Uh, that's his phrase. Baraso Sal Ki Golani. Now, this kind of rhetoric can have very unfortunate consequences. And it made me more determined to challenge the whole idea of perceiving this long 800-year period uh, or 1,200-year period uh, uh, in, in such uh, inflamed uh, uh, rhetoric. In fact, the whole idea of looking at India's past through the lens of religion, I came to understand is fundamentally flawed. And I came to understand that religion, in my view, uh, obviously it's an important, extremely important topic. We, can, we cannot think of Indian history without it. Uh, but I think it's been vastly exaggerated. Uh, and to a great extent, the whole issue of Hindu-Muslim encounter, I believe, is a back projection from the 20th century, looking back in, to the previous, previous thousand years, as if a thousand years of history was simply a prologue to the partition of 1947. And there's many reasons for this. I think the whole, the political history of South Asia in the 20th century, one thinks of the, the Indian nationalist movement uh, the Congress League uh, opposition, uh, the Pakistan movement, the two-nation theory, which was kind of the historical justification for a, a separate Muslim state in South Asia. And of course, the partition of 1947, followed by three wars. Uh, all of this uh, had the effect 
among many people, certainly the lay population, but including historians uh, on both sides of the Indo-Pakistan frontier, of looking at the past by way of explaining or legitimizing or understanding the events of the 20th century, in particular the partition. And I became convinced that honest history really requires that we look at the past on its own terms and not through the lens of our own political age. With all the, the kinds of prejudices and biases uh, that come with all of that. Um, certainly, when you look at the primary source evidence, you see very little that would support the idea of uh, religious communalism, uh, certainly nothing approaching the idea of a two-nation theory. Uh, that is completely uh, refuted by, I think, so many facts. So that when we look at India's rich past history, uh, many of the things that we might regard as religious phenomena were not necessarily seen as religious phenomena by their own contemporary in their own times. Uh, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, the, when the, the Ghaznavids and the Ghurids uh, first invaded North India in the 11th and 12th centuries, uh, the invaders were Turks and were not generally referred to as Muslims uh, by the Indians then living in North India. Uh, they were typically called Turushka or Turk. Um, or again, by the 17th century, the word Sharia did not carry the restricted meaning of, of Islamic law in the way that we think of it today, but rather it simply meant law, or more precisely, it meant legal. So we find across India in the 17th century, uh, many more non-Muslims than Muslims uh, making use of Ghazis and courts uh, and, and where they use the idea of Sharia simply as, as what, whatever was legal. Uh, you went to the Ghazi in order to resolve conflicts, in order to register documents, in order to record transfers of property, and so forth and so on. Uh, and uh, a third example, uh, if we look at the Deccan, which is one of my areas that I really began my career, and I keep coming back to the Deccan, it's a fascinating region of, of South Asia. Uh, well, here we have, for example, a, 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 go, a coin, uh, the Golden Hon of Krishnaraya, early 16th century. Uh, these were stamped out and issued by the, uh, the state, uh, 3.4 grams, 89% uh, gold. And what's interesting is that although the northern sultanates, which is the Bahmani Sultanate, and later on the, the, the independent sultanates of Golconda, and Bijapur, Bidar, Ahmednagar, uh, when they appear on the scene in the 16th century, the common people continue to use these coins of Vijanagara, uh, despite the efforts of the state to impose uh, their own coinage. And ultimately what happened was by the end of the 16th century, I'm sorry, in the middle of the 16th century. Uh, Pro Professor Eaton, uh, yes. sorry to interrupt you in between, but can you start from your first slide? There was some error and uh, certain people were uh, not able to see it. The first slide, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is the first slide. Maybe after that, this is the... The second slide. Yeah. Yes, I. this was simply the image of uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, mm -hmm. giving a speech. Do you see this? You see this? Yes. It, oh. uh, yeah, after that. Yeah, and then after that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Very good, okay. This is a coin of Krishnamaya, as I say, a uh, very fine coin, a golden hon, so-called. And my point is that by the time we come to the uh, 
17th century, even the sultanates of, of the northern Deccan had to issue coins that conformed to the, the Vijayanagara uh, gold hon. In fact, it was called a hon. Uh, and it had the same weight, 3.4 grams, and the same fineness, 89% gold, uh, as did the earlier one. But my point here being that the sultanates of the Deccan ultimately had to make their own coinage conform to what the people expected. Uh, and indeed, many of these coins even issued images of uh, Hindu deities, uh, uh, such as Lakshmi, uh, that would appear on the coins. This is a very similar pattern that one finds even earlier. Uh, here again, you have a gold coin of Muhammad of Gore in the early 13th century on the bottom with Lakshmi on the left uh, and his own name in Devanagari script, uh, more or less exactly imitating the coinage of the very dynasty that he had defeated, the Chohan dynasty. So we see in the top a silver coin of Ajaya Raya II, uh, where you see generally the same, uh, the same program. So in my search to find an alternative to religion, I ultimately settled on this idea of the Persian at world. Uh, and let me say a few words about that word, Persian at. The Persian at, of course, is simply an adjective derived from uh, the, the word Persian, uh, referring to the broader culture or civilization that is based on texts uh, written in the Persian language, we, or we can think of it analogous to, you know, uh, Germanic uh, or Hispanic or Italianate uh, and, and, and many other examples of that in other cultures. Uh, the word was coined originally by uh, Marshall Hodson back in 1973. Uh, but it didn't really take off. It didn't become widely popular for another 25 years, really the beginning of our century. Uh, <clears throat> but what Hodgson meant by the word Persianate was the, the, uh, the influence of Persian literary models on non-Persian literatures. In other words, languages like Urdu, and Turkish, or Malay, or Deccani, many others, would look to Persian models of poetry, of, of uh, prose, uh, and use the same kind of tropes and the same kind of, of uh, rhyming techniques that were already established in kind of classical Persian. So for, for, for Hodgson, it was a very narrow understanding confined to linguistics and to literature. But then along comes uh, a colleague of mine in the, only about 10 years ago, Sheldon Pollock, uh, published a book. Uh, Pollock is a Sanskrit uh, scholar, works on Sanskrit uh, literature and, and also history. And he came up with this notion of the Sanskrit cosmopolis. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and he, he elaborated this idea in a book entitled uh, the language of the gods in the world of men, referring obviously to, 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 to Sanskrit. And making the argument that a Sanskrit cosmopolis for him referred to this long, very wide region, not just South Asia, but really stretching from Kandahar uh, in, in eastern Afghanistan all the way through Southeast Asia. Uh, indeed, words like Kandahar and Singapore are, are both derived from Sanskrit. And in, he understood this region as an area where Sanskrit was a kind of a trans-regional language, a language that, that was above the various local regional vernacular languages and was understood as an elite language. Uh, but above all, it informed ideas of social order and moral order uh, sustained by the, the circulation of Sanskrit texts and Sanskrit scholars across all of South Asia and Southeast Asia. 
And I was very much attracted to this, to this idea of a Sanskrit cosmopolis. And it immediately occurred to me when I read uh, Pollock's book that the same idea of a cosmopolis could be applied uh, <clears throat> with even greater accuracy, I believe, in the case of Persian, where, again, you have a single language, Persian, uh, acquiring elite status, uh, stretching all the way from the Balkans in the west through Bengal to the Arakan coast uh, in the east. And throughout this region, roughly between the 9th and the 19th century, uh, Persian texts circulated freely uh, and were understood as normative, uh, which is to say people, uh, there was a great deal of prestige associated with the Persian language. Uh, as we all know, although Turkish speakers came and conquered North India uh, in the in the uh, 12th, 13th centuries, uh, they themselves were Persianized. Uh, they themselves patronized Persian language because Persian was the language of high culture. So, even more importantly, uh, when you look at the geography, it occurred to me that India happens to be the place where these two different cosmopolises or worlds, the world of Sanskrit and the world of Persian, both of them trans-regional languages, they happen to overlap in, in uh, South Asia. And what we really then see happening for about, well, indeed, the 800 years of my own book is a long period of protracted interaction between the Sanskrit and the Persian uh, worlds. And it seemed to me that is a fascinating uh, phenomenon. Uh, and that became really the, uh, the, 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 the centerpiece of my own study, because I came to see a, a much more fruitful way of understanding medieval history of India as one of interaction, not only between the Persian and the Sanskrit, but also between both of them and regional cultures. Because obviously, beneath these worlds of, of trans-regional Sanskrit and Persian, you obviously have the Gujarati, the Bengali, the Kashmiri, and the Marathi, and so forth. Uh, those worlds are all there. And uh, so the, the, the cosmopolitan languages of Persian and Sanskrit are interacting with th those local cultures even while they are interacting with each other. So then let me then uh, briefly run through some of the similarities between the Persian and the Sanskrit worlds. First of all, the languages were prestigious and the languages were trans-regional. Secondly, the literatures that appeared in these languages uh, were also trans-regional. Uh, they they, uh, are, they generated works of epic poetry, uh, as well as works of discourses, uh, abstract theorizing, and, and so forth. And in both cases, uh, they developed a canon, that is to say, an established uh, understanding of, of what are the classic works. And we all know that you know, in both Sanskrit and in Persian, uh, there was a very stable canon that, that survived over many centuries uh, in both of these languages. Thirdly, uh, they both were sustained by an institutional base. Uh, both of these languages and the literatures written in them were patronized by uh, both courts and non-courtly institutions. In the case of Sanskrit, uh, you have temples, you have monasteries, and you have royal courts. In the case of Persian, uh, you have madrasas, you have uh, Sufi uh, dargahs, uh, and, and as well as, of course, royal courts. So these institutional bases serve to uh, connect the peoples uh, tr uh, moving across this, this, this wider world. And I think the most useful way of thinking about this is to think of network theory where you have you know, each circle 
or dot that you see on this image might represent a Sufi dargah or a royal court or a monastery uh, or a madrasa or what have you. And then the lines between them would uh, reflect the movement of both people and texts between them. So you have an idea of circulation. And it's that circulation that gives this phenomenon its very elastic uh, uh, character, something that moves across space uh, rather dramatically. And the effect of this, this system, this network of either Sanskrit or, or Persian uh, literature and, and, uh, and poets, bards moving from, from place to place, is to establish an, an understanding of moral and social order that operated across vernacular regions. Uh, both the Sanskrit and the Persian elaborated ideas of proper etiquette, uh, aesthetic taste, uh, ideas of kingly comportment, statecraft, uh, universal royal sovereignty, uh, the acquisition of wealth and power, uh, proper modes of conduct, uh, architecture, and much, much more. So the other point I want to make, and the fifth point of similarity between the Persian and the Sanskrit, is that these ideas were never imposed by force. On the contrary, they were assimilated uh, or imitated by peoples uh, in, uh, in a very wide area of, of, uh, uh, of influence. Um, in other words, this kind of world is very much unlike a classical kingdom or an empire where you have a political center, the capital, uh, you have an army, you have a taxation system, you have fortified frontiers, you have a clear idea who was a citizen or a subject and who's not a subject uh, on the other side of the frontier. That's very different with, from what this is. This is a non-political phenomenon in the sense that it, the, the, this world was able to move across political frontiers as well as linguistic frontiers. An excellent example of this, which precedes the, uh, the, the, the Persian and Sanskrit worlds, was the Greek, the Hellenistic world, uh, dating roughly from Alexander, 323 BC, uh, down through the second century AD. And you see on this map, stretching all the way from Rome in the west uh, to the, the Indus Valley in the east, uh, where you have one world connected by, I mean, it's, it's it, well, I should say it's one world with many different political uh, frontiers, many kings uh, ruling in, in places like Egypt or, or Syria or Iraq, Iran, Anatolia, and, and the Balkans and so forth. But they are all connected by a common allegiance to Greek culture, Greek styles of, of architecture, Greek theater, uh, Greek language. Uh, and we see this particularly illustrated in the case of, of Northwestern India, uh, where we have, here we have uh, the ruler of one of these Greco-Bactrian kingdoms, uh, Apollodotus I, who ruled in the second century BC. And uh, you see here that the coins that he issued uh, look very classically Western or Greek uh, with Greek writing on them. But you also see on the bottom here, the other side of these coins, uh, you have both Greek script and Karashosti scripts, which is an indigenous uh, language uh, uh, of, of, uh, of Prakrit, uh, early Indian script that was used, and we see elephants and Brahmin bulls clearly indicating uh, this kind of accommodation between Greek and Indian culture, which is one of the most fascinating things about, about this uh, Hellenistic world, or if you will, the Greek uh, cosmopolis. The same thing is true in sculpture, where we see on the left uh, these uh, Buddha images uh, very much in the style of classical Greek uh, aesthetic ideas of form, uh, whether it's the more realistic facial characteristic or whether it's the the uh, the robe uh, with the various wrinkles in them. Uh, these 
are, are characteristics of, 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 of Greek aesthetics, merging obviously with Indian ideas. Um, so the, the point I'm coming to here then is that what we have uh, is a, uh, uh, a, 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 an understanding of the world of, uh, of, at least of India, as an area where these two trans-regional cultures overlapped. Charlie Pollock also advances the idea of the cosmopolitan vernacular. And what he means by cosmopolitan vernacular is when, in his case, Sanskrit uh, texts, for example, the Ramayana uh, or what, what have you, would be translated into vernacular Bengali or Hindi um, uh, or Tamil or what, what, what have you. And so there's a that interaction between the 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 trans-regional cosmo, cosmopolitan world and the vernacular world, where the vernacular world is again assimilating the tropes, the styles, uh, the indeed the content of Sanskrit classical works. And the same thing is true with Persian, uh, where, where Persian works are translated into local Indian languages. One thinks of the works of uh, Nizami Ganjavi, the great uh, romantic poet, uh, whose works like the Sekandar Nama or the Leili Majnun uh, were translated into many languages across North India uh, beginning in the 15th century. Or you think of Jami's uh, Yusuf and Zuleika, uh, immensely popular works uh, that were translated into languages all the way east as far as the Arakan coast of Burma. Uh, and so in this way, you have this interaction between the cosmopolitan and the vernacular. But I also have to say there are differences between the Sanskrit world and the, the Persian world, which are very important. The first one has to do with how these two languages related to bureaucracy and to governance. Now, the case of Persian is very clear. Uh, Persian was much more oriented to the practical business of, of bureaucracy and, and governance than was Sanskrit. As early as the fifth century in the original Persian empire, uh, you had a specialized class of professional writers and bureaucrats uh, whose job it was to maintain the records to to figure out the tax codes, to collect the taxes, uh, to administer justice, uh, and this kind of thing. And as each dynasty would change in Iran, the class of professional writers was, was continued. So each new dynasty simply used the same traditions, uh, they would inherit the same professional class of writers uh, that the preceding dynasty had used. Uh, this even uh, continued after the Arab conquest. The Arabs, after all, had very little, uh, in fact, no really experience in, in, in uh, imperial uh, bureaucratic management uh, before, the, uh, the, before the seventh century. And so it was, again, it was Persian writers and bureaucrats who, in a sense, uh, administered much of the Arab empire when it did appear. And, so we have this long tradition of bureaucracy and record keeping, uh, which is deeply ingrained in the Persian world, not so much in the Sanskrit world. In the Sanskrit world, uh, it's very typical to find inscriptions, for example, where the opening section, the prashasti, uh, would, would give an ornate uh, praise to the ruling king, the ruling raja, uh, but the actual administrative part of the inscription dealing with land records or land transfers, that might appear in uh, vernacular uh, Bengali, vernacular uh, Gujarati, vernacular Marathi, or what have you. Uh, so it's a very interesting kind of dichotomy between uh, of work where the Sanskrit was used for the more lofty purpose of praising the Raja and the vernacular language was used for the the everyday kind of business of administration. Uh, that's an important point because it means that 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 Persian uh, 
as we know, in the, in the period of the Delhi Sultans, and especially under the Mughals, uh, became the language of administration throughout the whole empire, reaching all the way down to the lowest level. And that had enormous implications because it meant that uh, this was a vehicle for the assimilation of, of many uh, writers' castes, such as the Kayestas, uh, to become assimilated into this Persian world. Uh, and that really takes me to the second difference between the, the Persian and the and the uh, Sanskrit worlds, namely social reach. Um, Persian was a a medium that was a, that was open to anybody, whereas Sanskrit always understood itself as a, a language that was, as we all know, uh, uh, privileged or monopolized by the upper castes. So as I just mentioned, it meant that any clerk uh, from any social background in India uh, could learn Persian uh, and get a job in the bureaucracy. Uh, so you have vast numbers of non-elite as well as Brahmins uh, entering the bureaucracy at, at all stages. Um, and we see this reflected in the enormous influence of Persian words uh, in the various vernacular languages of India. Uh, Persian words infiltrated virtual, virtually all the languages to one extent or another uh, of India. For example, in the 17th century, it's been estimated that some 40% of the words in Marathi, at least Marathi as spoken by the upper classes, uh, were derived from Persian. And of course, this is also true in Hindi, uh, as we all know. Uh, go back to that earlier slide. When Prime Minister Modi was dismissing the medieval period as 1,200 years of servitude or of slavery, Golani, it's very ironic, it seems to me, that fully seven words in that sentence of his, and you see them underlined in the slide here, seven words are either Persian or uh, Perso-Arabic uh, in origin. And then finally, the third difference between the Persianate and the Sanskrit worlds, it seems to me, is their attitudes toward other culture systems. There is a certain insularity uh, about Sanskrit and Sanskrit culture and a reluctance to assimilate knowledge from non-Sanskrit cultures. Uh, <clears throat> There was indeed a, a good deal of resistance to assimilating Persian knowledge, for example, about astronomy. It, it took a long time for ideas of, uh, of, of Persian or Greek uh, astronomy to, to be accepted in, uh, in the Sanskritic world. And when it was, uh, it was resisted always within the, the Sanskrit-speaking world. Uh, Biruni noticed this back in the 11th century very clearly. Biruni, of course, his famous Katabal Hind, uh, is a remarkable text which gives us a, a glimpse of the uh, of one of the earliest points of contact between uh, these two different worlds. Uh, by contrast, the Persian freely assimilated Greek, pre-Islamic Persian, and Indian uh, cultures uh, as well as Islamic culture, obviously, uh, into their learning. Uh, so there was much less resistance in the case of Persian to assimilating outside cultures. So with that, having, having said all that, I'd like to move on very briefly uh, to some of the questions that Professor Rezavi uh, put to me the other day uh, that I'd like to begin to discuss. One of them had to do with the ruling class of Vijay Vijayanagara, and it's absorbing of Persian ideas and practices even before the Timur wave uh, of the 15th century. And this is a remarkable point. Uh, <clears throat> yes, it's very true. If we look at something like architecture, uh, here, for example, is a government building in Vijayanagara dating to the 15th century, the so-called elephant stables. And if you look on the left-hand side, the, the vaulting techniques, the arching techniques uh, are come straight out of, the, out of the Persian world. And in the distance, you see domes, 
uh, in the, in the, the so-called stables. But my point here that this kind of uh, uh, engineering techniques, not only the architecture, but the use of mortar, uh, which was also something derived from the Turks, uh, all these clearly uh, evoke a, a, a Persian at world. Um, it, was, it was, if you will, the international style of the day. And interestingly enough, if we look at a mosque that was built about the same time as the, uh, the government buildings atop, below we have this mosque of Ahmad Khan, built in 1439, in classical Vijayanagara architecture. Now, I have to say that when art historians first saw this building, they could not believe that it was a mosque. This is because art historians are oftentimes um, inclined to associate certain styles with, with religion. And obviously, uh, that does not work. Uh, I think these two slides rather dramatically illustrate the fallacy of imagining such a thing as Hindu art or Islamic art. When you look at structures like this, clearly that doesn't work. Uh, there's another world, a different world, I would say a Persian world, uh, which is intervening in all of this, which upsets these rather simple uh, stereotypes. Um, or another example, here we are in the courtyard of the, the Norangi Darvaza in Raichur. This was built by Krishna Raya uh, in, uh, in the early 16th century, shortly after he conquered the city from, uh, from Bijapur. And if you look around the Right above the arches, uh, there is a series of panels uh, in stucco which relate the Ramayana epic story. And many major themes of the Ramayana are, are, are uh, revealed in, the, in this, this kind of uh, um, uh, architectural story. But where you see the red arrow is the king himself is situating himself in the middle of the Ramayana story. And he is depicted, as you see here, uh, with two female uh, 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 aides on his side, relaxing on his throne. But the important point is that on his head, he is wearing what in Telugu is called a kulai, which is simply derived from the Persian word kula, which is, means headgear and it was in the 15th century, 16th century, associated with, with Persian headgear. Again, we see the, the Vijayanagara king uh, publicly displaying himself in the international style of Persian high culture, wearing a kula. In fact, the word kula has been assimilated into Telugu, uh, which is another example, as I mentioned before, of the diffusion of this Persian culture. So these are some of the material aspects of, uh, of this world. And we see how the, the, the Persian culture extends beyond uh, North India and having nothing to do with the diffusion of, of state systems. Uh, this is obviously before Vijayanagar was conquered uh, by, the Delhi, by, the, by the Sultanates of, of the Northern Deccan. So again, it was assimilated. It was not imposed. Uh, the architecture that, that I showed you a moment ago uh, was assimilated and imita in imitation by the kings of, of, of Vijayanagara, not imposed from the outside. Having said that, it's also true that obviously regional cultures persisted and they continue to persist. There are regional understandings of what a proper building should look like. Uh, whether it be a mosque or whether it be a temple, does not matter. Uh, it must conform to regional understandings of style and aesthetics. So on the left-hand side, you see in Malabar and <clears throat> Kerala, uh, on the upper left, you have a, you have a temple. The lower left in Calicut, you have a mosque. Clearly, they are sharing a similar aesthetic uh, vision uh, where we see very little in the way uh, of Persian influence, virtually none. 
And on the right-hand side in Bengal, same thing. Uh, upper right hand in Vishnapur, uh, we have a, a temple, 17th century temple. And the lower right hand corner, we have in Maiman Singh, uh, the Atiyah Mosque, built also in the 17th century in Maiman Singh. Uh, and both of these structures share very similar vocabulary. You can see the curved cornice. Uh, it's not straight across on the top, but it's curved. Uh, you can see the, the terracotta uh, facade. Uh, with very fine artwork uh, in, in both of these structures. Uh, the three openings uh, and, and, and the, as well as the, the, the dome-like structures that, that appear on both of them and so forth. So I, I, I want to emphasize that the Persianate world never completely uh, swept over and, and as it were, uh, integrated all of India or conquered all of India, uh, neither did the Sanskrit world for that matter. Uh, what we find is regional cultures persisting uh, throughout the medieval period. This, I think, has to do a lot to do with the corridors of migration. The Turco Persian migration corridors moved, as you see, from, the, from Afghanistan uh, down through the Punjab to Delhi. Uh, and very, these arrows are very rough, obviously, just to give you a, a clear idea here. Moving from Delhi down the Gangetic Plain east toward Bengal and moving southwest into Gujarat and into the Deccan. Uh, but the point is that you see that Bengal and Malabar are, are both kind of off the radar. They're, they're, they're not quite, uh, they're not directly on these migration corridors. So we do not find uh, the, the evidence of, of this kind of culture. Uh, this Persian culture uh, uh, influencing the architecture of Bengal or Malabar to the same extent that it does in the Deccan in, or across the entire Indo-Gangetic plain in the north. Um, so I think what I want to do, uh, Professor Rezavi, is I think I might stop here and um, return to you if I can if I can do this stop sharing let's see um yes okay I can see you now finally <laughs> uh, professor I, you I, want if you can continue further I mean there is enough time oh, okay okay yeah, oh, you can continue a lot. Well, another question that you raised um, had to do with uh, a number of stereotypes that I uh, was challenging in my book, uh, such as the idea that India um, has a stagnant civilization. Uh, this, of course, is a very old colonial British trope, the idea being that India was essentially asleep until the British Raj came along and woke everybody up. Um, <laughs> we all know this. Uh, and it, it, oddly enough, it still survives even in, in <clears throat> more modulated forms. But even today, we get some aspect of that. So I just wanted to, in my book, uh, apart from highlighting the idea of the Persian, I also wanted to make very clear <clears throat> that India was in constantly kind of reinventing itself or becoming transformed in the course of these eight centuries. Uh, if we look at the world of ecology, we see the transformation of the land itself, uh, dramatic transformations. Uh, for example, in Eastern India, uh, what had been thick forest gets cut down and transformed into rice paddy which has enormous implications, obviously, with the, the, the cutting of the forest has everything to do with the, the growth of, of the population in places like uh, Orissa uh, and Bihar, and especially in Bengal, uh, <clears throat> where obviously the state is interested in, in, in expanding the area of rice cultivation for greater taxes. The same is true in Punjab, where irrigation transforms what had been relatively dry desert area, uh, the bar area between the, the rivers, uh, into wheat fields. 
and one can make uh, continue and make similar points about uh, South India and the Deccan, uh, where the land itself is being transformed. Uh, so there's that ecological dimension. There is the social dimension, where we have new communities emerging in this 800-year period. Uh, we have Rajputs, we have Sikhs, we have Muslims, we have Marathas, all of them either emerging for the first time or evolving uh, in new ways uh, in the course of these eight centuries. And one of the themes of my book uh, was to talk about uh, how these new communities emerged. Uh, they, they, obviously, these were not static. The Rajputs, for example, uh, were certainly not a, uh, throughout all of history, what we think of them today uh, as a martial uh, uh, clan uh, based system, but rather it's a, the word itself changed over time. The word Maratha changed over time. Um, and indeed, tribal communities were integrated into the caste system, uh, oftentimes with the trans transition from, from jungle to uh, rice paddy. We see that happening. Uh, repeatedly, where the, the uh, uh, in the uh, in the case of, of, of Hindu society, uh, economically we have increased monetization, uh, increasing volumes of silver are being imported, especially in exchange for the export of of spices and of textiles, and uh, all of this had to do with the the growth of the silk and the cotton industries in India to become the uh, industrial engine of the world uh, in the period of, of, of my book. That has to be talked about. Uh, in terms of architecture, uh, I just showed you some examples of, of, of how the influence of, of Persian uh, culture impacted uh, local societies, the introduction of mortar, for example, uh, facilitated uh, military architecture and fortification, as well as the building of domes and arches. Uh, and if we look at religion, uh, obviously the introduction of Islam, uh, pantheistic ideas of Ibn Arabi, uh, Sufi institutions, uh, totally transformed the face of the, the religious face of, of, of India. Uh, influencing e even new religions like the Sikh religion. And catalyzing all of these transformations uh, were the enormous forces that came from the outside. And that really is the, the leitmotif of my book, uh, those uh, influences that are associated with, with the, the Persian world. Uh, Professor uh, Eaton. Please, please. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, excellent. I mean, it's very hard to say that you should uh, uh, stop here, but uh, you know, that's very hard for me to say because uh, there is uh, so much mind information in your book. Uh, you know, I would first of all ask you a very basic question, uh, a few questions from me, and then I will, uh, we will go on to the questions which have been asked by some of the participants. Right. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, I would want to know that you had been writing on the Sufis, uh, uh, you wrote on Bengal, right? You wrote on the regions, right? But what made you think to write a textbook? And that too of this passion. How did you uh, do that? I mean, I, I'll, I'll just say one thing that, uh, you know, uh, medieval Indian history is something where we actually lack textbooks. Uh -huh. and a lot of people have been asking us, Aliga historians, that uh, we need textbooks, we need textbooks. But when I discussed this issue with some of our senior, uh, you know, uh, historians, uh, they do not really like to take up this idea uh -huh. of writing yeah. A so called textbook. Although, as you know, that Panabi Saab has written medieval India, which I mentioned. Right. So, what provoked you to write this book and how did you manage it? Well, that's a very simple question to answer. Uh, I, was, I was approached by uh, Penguin Books <laughs> about, actually, it's a long time ago. I, I think they, were, they originally asked me in the 
let's say the late 20th century uh, to, to write this book. And, but I had many other projects and I just put it aside. And because uh, uh, I was writing this, the social history of the Deccan for Cambridge. And then the book you mentioned, uh, Power, Memory and Architecture with Phil Wagner. I was writing these other books, so I was not able to get around to this. But I did want to write a textbook because it became clear to me that more people read textbooks than read monographs. Exactly. And if you really want to reach a large number of people, uh, you, you need to write a, a textbook. And uh, this is despite the fact that in the academic world, I mean, certainly in America, where I am, if you write a textbook, nobody pays any attention. Uh, mm. it's, it's not rewarded. You're not going to get a big book prize. Uh, <laughs> your colleagues don't really care that's all that much. Uh, it's, it's almost like writing a translation of something. A, a translation is also very low in the, in the, in the hierarchy of, of books in, in the academic world. Textbooks might be a little bit higher, but monographs are the, are the thing that people are supposed to do. Why? Because a monograph is giving new knowledge. You're going out into the field, you're discovering a new archive, you're discovering a new record, you're discovering a new, uh, I don't know, uh, ser series of documents that nobody's ever seen. And because it's new, Academics seem to think that this is something that we should be doing. And it is something you need to do. You cannot write a dissertation with a textbook. Uh, nobody will give you a doctorate or a PhD if you simply write a textbook. You have to write a, a monograph. But I've, I've already written a number of monographs. So I decided that now is the time, uh, especially now in this era of, of Modi Raj, uh, in, in Delhi, where India is, as we all know, is experiencing this very uh, stressful moment. Uh, I think it's time to have a fresh look at the medieval period, especially since the medieval period is what informs so much of today's politics. Uh, I mean, this whole idea of, of uh, Baraso Salki Gulami, uh, 1200 years of, of slavery, uh, is not only irresponsible, it's incorrect. And right. so I decided I decided that, that uh, yes, I would write a textbook. Hopefully it will reach more people than textbooks do. And hopefully it might even change people's minds. Right. So, uh, you know, uh, that would lead me to, uh, you know, ask you something which you have mentioned in your introduction itself. And that is that, uh, uh, you know, Indian history has been treated differently, say, from American history. Uh, in the introduction, you talk about the conquest which took place, uh, you know, uh, in Central and South America. Right. Uh, where, you know, there were forcible conversions. But in spite of that, uh, conversions, it has never been labeled as Christian conquest. Then you also go to point out that uh, the primary sources uh, for the period when the conquest in India were taking place, uh, the term is never being used Muslim. The term which is being applied is Turushka. Uh, I mean, uh, they, they are mentioning that this is a Turkish conquest. But today, as you point out, that it has been converted into a Muslim conquest. So can you please elaborate on this a little? Yes, I, I, no, that's a very good point. That's a, and, I, in fact, that's the reason I put that in the introduction is because I, that is that really has to be said at the very outset. Uh, you know, why is it that the Spanish conquest of South America <clears throat> and the Portuguese too, of course, in Brazil? Uh, why is this seen as a conquest, a a, a, a Spanish or Portuguese conquest? and not a Christian conquest, especially when, you know, those people came over in my part of the world with very specific plan. Uh, these conquistadors uh, were intent on, on imposing Christianity. They destroyed the temples of the Aztecs and, and Peru, the Incas in South America. Uh, 
and, and so on and so forth. Um, and yet, when we come to India, uh, we, we find a very different way of characterizing this period. And clearly, um, it seems to me that uh, a lot has to be said about the British uh, colonial period when it seemed to be a convenient way of the colonial rulers of the East India Company to justify their occupation of India by uh, seeing the immediate predecessors as, as oriental despots uh, who ruled India, but ruled it in an arbitrary way and, and, uh, and, and used violence against the Hindus uh, and this kind of thing. So there was, a, there was a, I think, a, a, a political need for the British to portray the immediate predecessors, which is to say a thousand years, 800 years of, of, um, of, of Turkish, Turco-Persian rule, to characterize all that as Islamic. Um, and I think that was in a sense parallel with the, the, uh, the way the, the Portuguese looked at India as well. When the Portuguese came to India, uh, they were fresh off after uh, driving the, the Muslims out of Spain and out of Iberia itself. And so there's a, there a continuation of that. And it seems to me that even though the, the British were Protestant and not Catholic, they still inherited much of that, that uh, vision of, of, of the, of the non-Western world. And uh, so we have, for example, in Mill's History of India, uh, uh, a clear, a tripartite division between Hindu, Muslim, and British. And there was a, 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 a need to understand, it seems to me, the, the way in which uh, history was written by the colonial writers in the 19th century was suggesting that uh, the British have arrived in order to restore India to the Hindus after it had been seized by these Muslims. And, and that we are the ones, we British are the ones who are doing the restoring. We are the ones who are, who, who are uh, making this possible. So it's, it seems to me almost, one could say politically necessary that the preceding 800 years had to be demonized, had to be projected as a period of, uh, of, of, uh, of decline, of decadence, of arbitrary rule, of mismanagement and so forth, because the British wanted to be seen as, as efficient and, and as just, whereas their predecessors, in their view, were seen as unjust. So the, that's, that's, how, that's a, a major, I think, uh, point that I think has to be made. And then, of course, when the nationalist movement comes, as we all know, in the late 19th century, uh, many of the Indian nationalists simply use many of the same ideas, the same tropes uh, that the British had already used and earlier in that same century, uh, and then they, they got recycled uh, in, in, uh, in, in nationalist discourse. So it's a complicated question, um, but it's a very important question, and I'm so glad you raised it. Uh, uh, sir, uh, you also raised a very pertinent point. Uh, you know, at Aligarh, we keep on, uh, uh, you know, stressing that uh, uh, to study medieval Indian history, uh, Persian texts are a must uh, because uh, th those are the texts in which most of the primary material has been written. And uh, somehow uh, a group of historians would give much more emphasis on what has been mentioned in the Persian sources. Uh, you, however, in your work, for certain reasons, uh, a caution us not to rely too much on the Persian chroniclers. And there is a reason for that. And I would want you to uh, explain it to the uh, readers. I think there's two reasons. Well, there's probably many reasons, but there are two important reasons that, that come to my mind. One of them is uh, that there is an enormous world out there of material culture, of non-textual culture, which I myself was largely unaware of until I met uh, my colleague, Phil Wagner, uh, 
and we we went around the Deccan Plateau looking at at hill forts, and we we, we simply studied the, the the material culture. Uh, we looked at cannons. We looked at how forts were constructed, and for me, as a conventionally trained textual historian, uh, to run around the Deccan Plateau with a with an art historian, an architecture historian, an archaeologist, in fact, uh, opened my eyes to the use of non-textual evidence uh, that we need to see not just uh, architecture, but we need to see coins, uh, we need to see uh, 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 art itself, obviously. Uh, so that's my first point, that we, we, that we must not confine ourselves to any kind of text. Hmm. Hmm. Now, when it comes to Persian, Yes, I, 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 again, I caution there because uh, most of the writers of these chronicles that we read were obviously servants of the court. Uh, they were patronized by either the Delhi sultans or later on the Mughals. Not all of them were, but, but, but I mean, people like Badawi uh, wrote his own private history. But for the most part, most of the chronicles reflect the vision of the court. And that has problems. A, because you're only looking at the world from the standpoint of, you know, over the ramparts of the, of the Red Fort. You're looking out over India uh, from the perspective of how the court wants to see it. That's, a, that's one problem. A second problem is that many of these writers uh, Persian writers had their own agenda. I discovered this when I was writing about temple desecration, and I realized that there was a real uh, disconnect between the claim made by Persian writers and the actual evidence in the field, which is to say many Persian writers and chronicles, chroniclers made the argument that sultans were regularly in the business of destroying temples. And, but if you, if you look at the evidence from, from inscriptions or the material evidence from archeology, span you do not find this kind of indiscriminate destruction uh, of, of temples all over the place. So that made me alert to the fact that, well, you know this, we, we need to be cautious here because the, we're only looking at the perspective of the chroniclers who may have their own ideas of what the sultan should be doing in their view. Well, uh, that's that's the point. Uh, well, uh, I mean, I, I would second you as far as uh, this information is concerned because, right. you know, a few years back, I had gone to Kalinjar uh, right. after reading uh, the information which has been given in the Persian sources of the Sultanate period. Right. Uh, so when we were exploring the uh, Kalinger Fort, we right. came across, uh, you know, a, a building with, which had no dome or which had no minaret, right. but uh, it had an inscription according to which it had been used as the as a mosque where the coronation of Islam Shah had taken place after the death of Shir Shah. Really? <laughs> and there in that, uh, you know, inscription, it's a Persian inscription. I have got a rubbing of that. Right. There were claims of how uh, the, the, the remains of the temples and idols had been uh, broken. But Shakani was mentioned with pride. Right. But when, after reading that, when we explored the, uh, you know, the Kalinjar Fort, and right. there are still many uh, temples there uh, from the Gupta period, not a chisel mark could be seen. So, yeah. yes, there is an exaggeration of and you know a bombastic uh, you know claim that that has been done which has to be tempered with other sources and actual evidences which exactly. we have uh, uh, yeah. uh, right right sir you know uh, there is uh, one aspect uh, uh, i mean when i was going through your book as i pointed out that uh, one of the usps of your book is that unlike the other textbooks and other books uh, on written on medieval india uh, which confined themselves only to the Delhi Sultanate and to the Mughals, you, you go into the Deccan Sultanates. Right. 
but then uh, uh, throughout your book there is hardly any chapter on bijapur and golconda although when you talk about the passionate culture i mean i was expecting uh, and you have dealt with both these there is no doubt i am not saying that you have not dealt with them in detail but but you know that that is all interspersed in the chapters of jahangir shah jahan and aurangzeb right okay uh that's a fair question uh after all my i began my career with bijapur uh i i lived in hyderabad for a year and a half uh, surrounded by you know kutub shahi golconda uh culture i was right there um it's a very difficult thing to to write a history of all of india uh, <laughs> and and i and, and i did devote chapter 4 uh to to the south deccan and the south where i talked about the bahmani and the vijayanagara together i i want to make one point here on that it seems to me that when when most historians talk about the deccan they tend to refer to the northern deccan uh we hear about the bahmani sultans and then the 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 successor states ahmednagar bidar bijapur golconda um as if vijayanagara was living in a different world and uh this is a a problem i think which has persisted really almost down to to the present day and my effort was to reunite the deccan in in one chapter and talk about vijayanagara and the bahmani sultans uh at the same time um uh, i even go so far as to argue based on the evidence of the early founders of vijayanagara empire uh that vijayanagara really grew up uh in the womb of the delhi sultanate under muhammad bin tughluq uh that the who ruled the whole area Uh, the south as well as the northern deccan so my point in, was to in a sense consider the deccan as a unit and not simply the northern deccan uh cut off from the south um that's the first point the second point is that uh the 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 the, the status of of bijapur and golconda is dealt with in chapter 4 but obviously not to the same extent that i did in, in with north india uh and i think my decision to devote the last three chapters to the moguls was driven by the need for uh, a connective narrative uh where I, i you know i i to start with babur and continue on through aurangzeb uh in fact devoting a whole chapter just to aurangzeb alone uh, was rather extravagant uh but to do that was largely strategic i needed to find some some way of holding this whole thing together so that you're quite right uh, bijapur golconda uh only appear uh, or mainly appear uh, in the context of the mogul uh mm. attempts to conquer the deccan and i perhaps could have given more attention to the the uh the sultanates on their in their own right i did to some extent chapter 4 does have that but yeah, yeah. perhaps i can do more uh so uh you know before uh, i take up the questions yeah uh, from the others there is one uh, aspect which i think uh, is important as far as our young students are concerned yeah and that is as you uh, rightly mentioned that the vijayanagar ruler took up the title of hindu raya sultana uh, where the term hindu uh, you know hindu raya sultana right similarly shivaji uh, when uh, he took up the kingship uh, he took up the title of hendar uh, hendava dharmo dharak or as you write dharmo uh, dhakla so i mean uh, the terms hindu which appear here in some of the textbooks they take it as uh, to be a uh, uh, assertion of the hindu religion against the foreign moguls uh, uh, how what would you say 
Well, this is a very, very complicated uh, and contested uh, question. Um, and I think the reason it's contested is because different actors, different people are using the same word in different ways. And it makes it very difficult for historians who, who would like to have a world in which one word means one thing all the time. And the reality is that doesn't work. That doesn't happen. Uh, no, I, I asked this question in the sense that, uh, you know, when Nader Shah, uh, you know, attacked India. Right. When he came to Delhi, he called the uh, Mughal ruler, the emperor, as Hinduane Kalmago. Right. Uh, I mean, uh, those Hindus... I never knew, by the way. Yeah, I, I never heard that. But I yeah, was yeah, fascinated yeah. to learn that from you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, for, thank you for that information. And, and my response is uh, clearly, I mean, Nadir Shah is an outsider. Yeah, he he has not studied Indian history. <laughs> he hasn't taken my course or your course, uh, and so to him, he using he is using the word Hindu in a very ancient, early sense. I mean, the the first Turks who came to India. Uh, use the word Hindu to refer to anyone who lived in the Indus Valley or East. Sir, sir even I mean, does that. Right, right. So Nadir Shah is, is adopting the same kind of uh, much earlier understanding of, of Indian, um, and the word Hindu is simply meaning Indian, uh, with the one qualification that the Mughals were, as you say, uh, Hinduane Kalimagu, which is to say Indians who recite the Kalima. Right. Uh, that's the only difference. Otherwise, they're all the same. Yeah, because uh, the yeah. researches which have been done by Irfan Saab, Irfan yeah. Abid has written, uh, you know, an article right. on the language, and there right. he tries to argue that uh, the term hin Hindi or Hinduvi, these were the terms not being used for any religion as such. No, uh, no. Yeah, yeah. That's absolutely correct. In fact, I, I, I looked into this myself. Um, the, the, um, the uh, what is it called? The, the, I think it's the Futahata Salatin by Isami. This is a historian in the mid 1300s, 1350. He's in yeah. the Deccan Plateau yeah. at yeah. the very time that the Bahmani Sultan, the first king mm -hmm. of Japanese is established. And he, in his book, he talks about, about he uses the word Hindi, meaning Indian, not Hindu, but yeah. Hindi. He talks about the Safi Indian, which is the ranks of the Indians. Uh, and he's referring to Turks of the Delhi Sultanate vis-a-vis -vis the Mongols, the infidel Mongols of the outside world. So to him, he didn't call the Turks Turk. He called the Turks uh, Hindian uh, because they were living in India, defending India. And, and that, that's, that's interesting. But he, but he also used um, uh, the word Hindu yeah. uh, in, in, in a religious sense. And to my understanding, that might that could be the first time that anyone used the word Hindu to, in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a religious sense. But certainly the, the, the Hindus themselves did not use that word. You are you are correct. It's a it's a word that was used by outsiders. Uh, well, now uh, I will take up a few questions, uh, which have been asked by. Uh, well, there is a, a question which has been put up by uh, Kamlesh Mohanji. Uh, uh, the question is, Professor Eaton. Tell us about the shared past between the elite and common people. About the what, please? The elites and the common people. No, no it the is shared their past. Yeah. Right. Well, um, that is such a complicated, it, it's actually such a broad <laughs> question. It, it, it's hard yeah. to know where, where do you begin? Uh, it's so general, it's, it's, it's difficult to know where to start. But every society has elites and commoners, and there's always some kind of interaction between the two. Uh, and if we're talking about 
it depends on where we're talking about, what period, and what society. Uh, but I guess this relates to my earlier question about how Persian culture tended to be elite, uh, mm. in the sense that it was a it was a, a language and a culture that was originally alien to India, but it quickly becomes indigenized as more and more Indians get absorbed into this worldview. Uh, I gave the example of the 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 bureaucracy under the sultans and especially under the Mughals after Akbar. Uh, where Persian is the only language that's used in administration. This means that hundreds of thousands of, of, of non-Muslim uh, Indians are becoming absorbed into the Persian world. How does that happen? They study the works of Persian poets like Sa'adi and Hafez. And when you read the Golestan of Sa'adi, you become assimilated into a, a vision of the world, of ethics, of morality, uh, of, of social relations, uh, and so forth. And my point being that uh, common people taking up uh, ordinary jobs at low levels of the bureaucracy were, in fact, incorporated into this elite Persian world uh, in, in, in ways that I think had even greater social reach than the Sanskrit world did. Exactly. Uh, you know, you think of Tukaram, uh, the great poet of Maharashtra, uh, the Bhakti poet, who was punished for for using for for, for writing religious texts uh, by the Brahmins, you know, in in in, Mah in Maharashtra. Uh, so there was this very kind of rigid line between between the 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 upper caste. Uh, uh, and and the and the commoners, the non-Brahmin community, and we do not find that kind of rigidity uh, occurring in the case of the Persian world. It's much more fluid. Right, 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 right. Uh, well, there is another question by uh, Mr. Razi Raziuddin. Uh, he's also settled in U.S. Uh, he asks, I wonder what could have been the reason for not migrating towards Bengal. I mean, you just pointed out in your map that the migrations which took place uh, through the Indo Gangetic Basin, they stopped just near Bengal. So he wants to uh, ask about the reason why so many migrations did not take place in the uh, Bengal region, which was on the migration route. This is his question. Well, I'm reminded of a. Uh a European observer in the 17th century. Uh, it, I'm not sure, I can't recall which one it was. It could have been Bernier or Manucci. Um, anyway, uh, I, one of the Europeans described Bengal as a, a cul-de-sac, which is once you fall into it, you cannot get out. Uh, mm. it's, it's, a, yeah. it's a dead end. And yeah, yeah, the yeah. major reason for that has to do with the topography and the land. Uh, when you consider that the, the basis of, of Turkish power, Mughal power, was the horse and cavalry, and you try to move cavalry into the swamps and the, and the wet, marshy lowlands of Bengal, uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to maneuver. So that the sheer land itself, uh, is prohibitive of, uh, of, of armies that are based on cavalry. And so there's a long history of, of Bengal being seen as a, as a, as a, as a very separate zone. Uh, that you have a long history of independent Delhi, uh, of Bengal sultans, who once they're there, they achieve independence. Delhi can never reconquer them. And I think ultimately it has to do with topography, that the sheer fact that it's yeah, difficult yeah. to move horses around. Uh, well, well, well Professor, I will add something uh, uh, to what you I mean, the a question which I will add. Sure. Uh, you know, you know, I have also gone to Gore and Pandwa and certain other places in uh, Bengal. Right. Uh, what surprised me was that uh, most of the uh, sources, texts of the Bengal Sultanate 
they are written in persian just like the other texts of the delhi sultanate in the places right but when you come to the inscriptions they are generally in arabic yes i mean this dichotomy i could not understand that when the books are being written and the poets who are there in the court they are all persian right. but once you are writing down the inscriptions i saw them in the british uh, museum also then at the site in gaur and pandwa they are generally in arabic why, why this happened i have no answer for that not only inscriptions but inscriptions with very ornate calligraphy yeah yeah, yeah, really yeah amazing some of the finest calligraphy in all of india uh, is the arabic inscriptions that you're referring to yeah, well those yeah. inscriptions I, i i assume that those inscriptions were on mosques is that correct uh, uh, some on mosques but some on structures which are not mosques that's interesting i have to go back and look at uh, there's a well there's a book by, called uh, the inscriptions of bengal by shamsuddin ahmed Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to go back and look at that, and 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 it would be interesting to to see how many inscriptions were ex were were only on mosques, and how many Arabic inscriptions were used on on uh, you know palaces or or other things. I'm not aware, but that would that would be something to look into. Uh, sir, there is a question by Syed Ali Kazim. Uh, he teaches at Aligarh Muslim University. Uh, he asks. how did turkish word lag behind the persianate word despite the fact that the turkish speaking people had exercised political power much more than the persian world in the history of islam so much so that still a greater part of northwest iran speak persian with a turkish accent right um well that's a another great question you know how did the turkish world lag behind the persian world um i think it has to do with the fact that the turks as we all know began as nomads from central asia uh who arrived through a long process of migration uh confederations of turkish speakers moved in when thinks of the seljuks uh <clears throat> uh and 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 many other confederations moving through central asia into the iranian plateau and uh as they came into the iranian plateau which includes afghanistan and in and indeed central asia as well uh they came into an area that was already uh the heartland of of, of persian literature and persian language modern persian really began in the area of bukhara uh in in under the samanid dynasty and and uh it already achieved uh literary status not just literary status but uh classic and epic uh status uh, ferdosi had written his shahnameh uh, in the early 11th century and so when turks reach this zone they are coming into an area where there's already a, a high prestige language and they understand that in order to govern this area in order to rule with any credibility they have to cultivate the language which is already associated with power and prestige so they voluntarily learn persian uh, it's another example of how persian was not imposed by anybody uh it was simply borrowed and assimilated taken up by the turks uh who continued of course to speak turkish at home uh amongst themselves but they would use persian obviously in any kind of public discourse um and this of course as we know continues when the turks come into india uh they continue to uh they to to, to speak turkish at home but using persian as the the language of administration of literature uh of educational discourse and so forth uh so uh, there is a question by chandrashekhar tampi uh the question is uh that there is a very little contemporary account other than khadi khan on papadu 
how did you then retrace his history given most of what is available on pap papudu were ballads and folklore right well, papudu is a yeah right this is an interesting uh character of the deccan uh about whom i devoted a whole chapter in my book on the social history of the deccan uh he was a bandit uh, he was a, a kind of a dashing Robin Hood-like figure uh, that, that I found particularly interesting uh, because he illustrated the phenomenon of the, the social bandit. Um, how did I find information about him? Well, most of the information about him, uh, in addition to folklore, yes, there is a rich tradition of Telugu folklore about it, which survives down to today, I might add. Uh, among the toddy tappers, especially of, of Andhra Pradesh. Uh, but most of the information that I used came from uh, the, the Persian sources that uh, reflected the efforts of uh, the Mughals to, to suppress him. Because he, he was, he emerged at a time when Golkanda, after Golconda had already been defeated and the Mughals were trying to consolidate their government. And you have this bandit, this very dashing figure, uh, who has a very unhappy ending. And so the, the, the sources that I used had to do precisely with the, uh, the, uh, that, the, the, the Persian text dealing with his, his capture and so forth. I also found some, some, some archaeological evidence by visiting the sites that, where he ruled in, between Warangal and Hyderabad, uh, a little place called Shapur, uh, which is a fascinating place. That was his hideout. It was a mountain fort uh, where where he uh, was perched, and uh, uh, and it was quite a dashing figure, extraordinary figure, fun to write about too. Uh, yeah. So uh, there is a question by Ashok Mathur. Uh, Professor Eaton, do you think the influx of cultures into India in terms of language, lifestyles, religion was more than its outflow during the medieval times? Um, yes, a good question. Another excellent question. Uh, the short answer is yes. I think there's there's more evidence of of the influx of cultures outside of India coming into India uh, rather than the reverse. The great exception, obviously, is Buddhism. Uh, when we have to consider the pre the the ancient period, um, when Buddhism became obviously an international phenomenon, transformed uh, uh, so much of East Asia. But apart from the diffusion of Buddhism, uh, the, the diffusion of Indian culture, which is significant because obviously India is exporting a great deal of material goods, and a lot of culture goes with that. When you, when you think of the, the, the trade routes leaving, leading uh, through the Punjab into Central Asia or the maritime routes. Uh, but by and large, it seems to me that the... The India occupying the center of the Indian Ocean meant that it was exposed to culture coming in from all sides, uh, especially from the the, uh, the Arabian Peninsula and the, and the Persian Gulf. And uh, just a simple point to compare it here: uh, one does not find the diffusion of Sanskrit uh, language and Sanskrit influence on the Iranian Iranian plateau anywhere near to the extent of the influx of Persian liter text on, on, in India itself. Uh, so I would answer your question uh, within the affirmative, yes. Uh, sir, there are a large number of questions which have been put up and I think uh, we are exceeding the time, but still, uh, and, and you must be quite tired, but- no, uh, no, no. Having, uh, morning. You must be tired. It's, 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 no, no, not at all. It's, it's uh, morning. This is only uh, eight o'clock in the morning here. So, <laughs> when there is a question by you, Hassan, yeah. uh, he asks, "It has been observed by some authors uh, 
that many of the rulers of medieval oblique modern persia have been of turkish origin assuming that to be true to what extent was the persianate world influenced by turkish language and culture amir khosro in india could be seen as an example of a persianized turk yes that's true uh <clears throat> Okay, the extent of uh, of influence of Turkish on Persian, you know, yep. one of the best kept secrets in Iran today is that probably half of the population of of modern Iran uh, is Turkish speakers as native language of Turks. Uh, I learned this when I lived in Azerbaijan, in Tabriz, uh, which is part of north northern Iran, and everybody there spoke Turkish. uh it, as the first language um and and yet such is the 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 power of of persian culture and and the prestige of persian literature that the turks see themselves as really uh the guarantors and the protectors of uh of persia itself which is quite extraordinary i'll give you a very quick uh, anecdote Uh, about eight years ago, I was in Iran, and I was in a taxi cab in Tabriz uh, with a <clears throat> Iranian from Isfahan, a, a Paka Iranian, uh, who, who spoke only Persian. And the taxi cab driver was a Turk uh, in Tabriz, and they got into an argument over how to interpret uh, a, a particular line of poetry. Uh, of Rudaki. Now, Rudaki is one of the earliest poets of Persian in, 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 in Bukhara, Samanid dynasty. And it was interesting to me to see a Turk and an Iranian, or a native Iranian Persian speaker and a, a native Turkish speaker, they're both Iranian, but they're in the taxi cab and they were arguing over how to interpret a Persian couplet by Rudaki and the Turk would not give, he would not yield. Uh, he he insisted that 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 he understood Rudaki better than did this Isfahani, and I I I, I took that as a great example <clears throat> of how the degree to which Turks are assimilated into the Persian world. It is true that <clears throat> that some Turkish words uh, did enter Persian language, but not many. Uh, for example, the, the word for slow. Uh, in modern Persian is yavash, whereas in classical Persian it was aste. Aste, of course, is what you speak in, in Hindi and, 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 and came in an earlier period. So we do have some evidence of, of some vocabulary, Turkish vocabulary coming to Persian, but very little, very small. Uh, yes. so, uh, there is another question by Simrin Biswas. And she asks, What role did the Sufis play in the diffusion of Persian culture? Immense, huge role. Uh, I mentioned the Sufi Darga as one of the institutional sites where Persian language uh, was disseminated um, together with madrasas and royal courts. Uh, but we have much evidence, and it's easy to reconstruct, the movement of Sufis, of Marid, followers of, of Murshids, of great sheikhs, from, from Darga to Darga to Darga. And, uh, and it's interesting that <clears throat> although in many respects Persian is divorced from the Islamic religion, when it comes to Sufism, Uh, Persian is absolutely central. Uh, the vast majority of the great works of, of Sufism in India are written in Persian. Even in the, in the Deccan Plateau, where you have Muslims speaking Deccani, uh, for purposes of writing, most of their discourses would be appearing in Persian. Uh, so I would, I would answer your question by saying that the, the Sufi Dargahs, in a sense, are Are, um, are vessels that kind of retain, even today, a, a very powerful component of, of Persian culture and Persian language. Uh, when you go to, when you hear the Qawwali music, uh, 
which is sung in the Dargas. Uh, there's a very high percentage of Persian vocabulary, uh, which is in the in the in the lyrics that you hear, and that is an example of how these Sufis Sufi Dargas have have uh, have served as a as a as a stabilizing influence in, in in not only disseminating but retaining the influence of of Persian language. Uh, so uh, the same person, Sibreen uh, Biswas, asks another question. Uh, why do you think Islam is treated with abhorrence, not just today, but since the very beginning? It appears extremism can be seen in every religion. Um, why do I think Islam is treated with such abhorrence today? Well, that's a very loaded question. <laughs> it's, it it's like asking... Uh, why, why are you still beating your wife? Uh, I, I mean, nobody wants to answer that question because if you try to answer the question, you're already admitting that you're beating your wife. And, and uh, so, <laughs> um, uh, but you might be referring to current events. I mean, obviously things that are happening today in France, uh, we're all reading about what the, the terrible things that are happening there where, um, uh, where the, the French government is all but proclaimed war on, on Islamist uh, um, uh, presence in, in, in that country. Uh, but that's a political issue. And, and I think we have to be careful about not generalizing what happens in one country as speaking for everywhere in the world. Um, I mean, the situation in my country is very, very different from France. Uh, I have to say that there's no comparison. Um, so, yes, my answer would be it's essential that we look at each case, each region on their own terms and not succumb to making any broad sweeping generalization. Uh, well, uh, there are two questions from Ali Kazim, uh, who had earlier asked. There are two more questions from him. One is, where do you place Ibn Sina, who was born in Bukhara, wrote in Arabic, and stayed much part of his life in Persia, Hamadan? All three worlds, Persian, Arabic, and Turkish, would appropriate him. Uh, Ibn Sina is absolutely, I, I mean, I agree with, the, uh, with uh, Mr. Kazim entirely. He's correct. Uh, Ibn Sina is one of the greatest thinkers of, of world history, without a doubt. Whether we're talking about science, uh, we're talking about philosophy, we're talking about medicine, uh, in all these realms. And, and I think uh, the short answer is the reason why the, the, the Arabic, the Persian, the Turkish, all three uh, claim him is simply because of his enormous prestige. Uh, uh, Ibn Sina has oftentimes appeared on postage stamps in Iran, for example, uh, obviously indicating that the, the, the Persians obviously uh, wish to uh, uh, associate him with, with Iran and more specifically with, with Persian language. Uh, but in fact, he was a polyglot. Uh, he used all these languages uh, and he was, he was an immense thinker uh, whose influence has, has spread across all of uh, all of Asia, well, all the world. So I think that the the short answer is uh, everybody wants to claim him uh, precisely because of his prestige and his, his influence. Uh, another question by uh, Dr. Kazim is, can we use Turkish world terminology for areas under Mamluk rule of 300 years till 1517, and later on under Ottoman rule over Holy Land till the First World War. Could you repeat the first part of that question? Can we use? Can we use Turkish world terminology for areas under Mamluk rule for 300 years till 1517, and later on under Ottoman rule over Holy Land? Till the First World War. Uh, I mean, Turkish terms for the area, for, they're talking about geography, in other words. Turkish words for 
areas, yes, under Mamluk rule. Um, well, I, I, of course we can until 1517 when, when, uh, when Sultan Selim conquers the Mamluks. Uh, obviously, uh, it, it becomes under a different political regime, but the terminology uh, ought to remain the same. I don't see why not. Sure. Um, the Ottomans ruled, obviously, until the First World War. That's quite correct. So we, we can talk about this. But usually, geographical names oftentimes take the name of the, of the dynasty that rules over them. So we talk about the Mamluk Egypt. We talk about Ottoman Egypt. Um, and the same is true in Palestine uh, and elsewhere. Uh, sir, there is one uh, a little uh, sort of a critical question. I don't know. Uh, there is one Bikar Ali, and uh, he asks: Sufi has nothing to do with Persia. Uh, it's Shias. Please uh, make updates. I don't know what he wants by that. Uh, uh, he thinks that uh, Sufis, uh, you know, have nothing to do with Persia. And uh, the uh, Persians are Shias, and the Shiism has nothing to do with Sufism. Probably that is what I understand his question. Well, I, I, I think uh, Mr. Vikar Ali is probably referring to uh, Shah Ismail Safavi at uh, the beginning of the 16th century, who imposed uh, Shia Islam over the Iranian plateau. Uh, Famously, he brought in Iraqi clerics uh, from Lebanon uh, in order to in order to transform what had been a mainly Sunni Iran into a mainly Shi'i Iran. Uh, and it is true that many people fled to India uh, during this persecution. Uh, many Sufis uh, reach India in the 16th century, 17th century, as a result of this persecution. So I, in one sense, I would agree uh, with Mr. Ali entirely uh, that, that Iran experienced a dramatic transformation uh, in, in, in its ideological orientation, religious orientation, uh, as a result of Ismail uh, and, and his efforts to, to transform the, you know, the world from Sunni to Shia. That does not completely um, extinguish Sufism from Iran, however, uh, especially in the southeastern part of the country, around Kerman. Uh, there are a number of Sufi orders, the, the uh, 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 let's see, the, the, I think it's the Nematawadu uh, order, is still alive and active. In fact, I went to the shrine, the Sufi shrine in Kerman, uh, about eight, or eight years ago, uh, and you can see even today, the influence of, of this, this one institution in the whole region of Karaman, Iran, today. And then you have poetry. Uh, if you go to Shiraz, you'll find that the, the most important shrines are those uh, over the, the grave sites of Sa'adi and Hafez. Um, and Sufi ideas and Sufi sentiments are completely permeating Persian poetry and Persian language ever since then. So in a sense, Sufism never did leave Iran. It survives even today in the, the poetry, in the ghazals. You look at Rumi, Molana Rumi, uh, one of the greatest Sufis in world history. Well, he wrote everything in Persian, of course, even though he settled in Konya in Turkey. Uh, his his book, the the uh, the, the Divan of Shams Tabriz, and his Masnavi, are among the most widely read uh, works of, of Persian literature even today in Iran. So I would suggest that even though, despite the efforts of, of Shah Ismail to 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 uh, to persecute Sufism, uh, it has definitely survived in the poetry of Rumi, among others. Uh, sir, uh, I'm sorry. I mean, there are so many questions. That's okay. 
Uh, there is another question by Simreen Biswas, uh, and that's a good question. Uh, Professor Eaton, what role did the practice of Persian as a language of administration play in alienating the vernacular languages developing in medieval India? Well, I yes, I disagree. I, I would not argue that Persian alienated uh, vernacular languages. Uh, to the contrary, what's interesting is that that at the very moment when vernacular languages were achieving literary status, you think of uh, you know when we talk about 15th century uh, Bengali or Marathi. Uh, these languages were achieving their their own literary status at the same time that that Persian was infiltrating them, and so that I think I mentioned earlier in my talk that uh, in the 17th century, some 40 percent of the vocabulary, 40 percent of the words in Marathi, were were Persian. Um, indeed, Shivaji tried to. Uh, cleanse Marathi of all of its Persian elements um, when in, in the in the in the late 17th century, and I would suggest that the very attempt to to uh, to drive all the Persian out of Marathi is itself evidence of how much Persian had already infiltrated that language by that time. So yeah, there is a there is a. I rather there is to some degree a tension between the two, uh, but I would also say that the Persian words become assimilated into these indigenous languages to such an extent that even native speakers do not recognize them as Persian anymore. I mean, when I was studying Bengali in Bangla, so many words are in, in Persian that, that or, I mean, originally Persian that come into Bengali, Bengalis do not know that they're Persian. Uh, they think their their pukka Bengali words have been there all the time, or maybe derived from Sanskrit. That's not true. So there is an unconscious uh, acceptance of um, uh, of Persian vocabulary, which has occurred. And uh, as I said at the outset, that's one of the most dramatic examples of the degree to which Persian has influenced India, is in language and vocabulary. Uh, so, uh, just uh, uh, the last question to you. Uh, probably it is Rana Safi who is uh, asking, why was Sufism at odds with Shism, considering most Sufis claimed descent from Hazrat Ali and were lovers of Ahlul Well, I don't think that's a... <laughs> it's a great question. I think that there's a... Simplest answer is a question of authority. Um, I mean, whereas a Shia, properly speaking, uh, believes that authority has to go back to uh, Hazrat Ali, obviously, and Hassan Hussein, uh, the the Sufi will oftentimes put the authority of of, of, a, of a, a, a living Sheikh or even a, 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 an earlier, a, a deceased sheikh uh, in a higher position. And the, the whole phenomenon of peer patasty, of, of, of worshiping peers, uh, would suggest a, a certain conflict of, of, of authority uh, that I can imagine easily how many uh, Shias would be opposed to the idea that anybody uh, could have the, uh, could share authority uh, with the, the, the founders of, of, of Shiism itself, starting with Ali. So that would be great, right, sort of that. Yeah. Uh, well, sir, although I said that this was the last question, but then again, last, <laughs> really the last question. <laughs> okay. And uh, that is uh, uh, being asked uh, to you on behalf of both of us, Shagufta and myself. Uh -huh. Uh, what is the role of historians in the present age, in this age where we find myth-making more important than history? What role do you suggest to us, the historians? 
Oh, that's, that's probably the most important question that we've had today. Um, I, I really believe that. I think the fundamental role of the historian is to evaluate the past on its own terms in order to inform people of the present how they came to be what they are today. Because history is like evolution. We all evolved out of the past, and the past had evolved out of a deeper past. So there's a constant dialogue between the past and the present. We're always talking about the past. And the past is speaking to us in a, in a mute fashion. And it seems to me the, the responsibility of the historian is to evaluate contemporary evidence on its own terms and understanding the past as the people themselves understood that past, as opposed to projecting our values and our prejudices and our ideas onto the past. As I mentioned at the very outset this morning, or this evening, I should say, for you, um, I think that one of the greatest difficulties that India is experiencing is the tendency of people living after 1947 to project all of the today's prejudices and, and today's conflicts, whether they be seen in political terms of India and Pakistan, or they become seen in religious terms, Hindu Muslim, the problem of projecting those same attitudes and, and prejudices onto the past, as if the past actors knew what happened in 1947. They did not know. Uh, so we need to understand the past on its own terms. And the, the job of the historian is to evaluate critically all evidence without taking any prejudice of, of his or her own into that endeavor. That is a challenge. It's very difficult to do that. Many historians uh, are, uh, whether they mean to or not, uh, they bring their own agenda and their own prejudices into their understanding of the past. Uh, but we need to make the attempt not to do that, but to, to understand the past on its own terms. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, it was uh, an enchanting session, let me say. Uh, yeah, my ticker shows that uh, it's more than two hours uh, uh, that uh, this session continued. Well, uh, uh, I, I just don't have words uh, to thank you enough. Well, I would like to thank you. <laughs> no, sir. No, I, I, this is a great opportunity. As I said at the outset, uh, in, in this age of COVID-19, it's so difficult for any of us to, to communicate um, <laughs> except by these, this kind of technology. And uh, so I really appreciate the opportunity that you have given me to share some of these ideas uh, with all the people in, in, in India, or uh, with anyone who's listening, anyway. In fact, you know, uh, we had interacted uh, way back in uh, 2007. You might not be remembering that, uh, because I had read that author on temple destructions, and I was enamored right. when I met you in the canteen and had a cup of oh, yes, yes, yes. with you. I remember that. Uh, thank you for the COVID that we meet again in this fashion. Uh, so, uh, there are, I mean, a certain takeaways uh, from your lecture. And one of them is that architecture has no religion, as you pointed out. Right. Uh, uh, you, you showed the slides in which you tried to show that how a mosque is built in a fashion as if uh, it's any other indigenous Indian structure without any, uh, uh, you know, dome or anything. Whereas uh, you showed a palace structure, which had the dome on top right. of it. Exactly. I would remind uh, the, the, the uh, you know, viewers that this is not confined only to the Deccan. No, in no. fact, in uh, Ayodhya, at Ramki Pedi, the place where, uh, you know, uh, the uh, foundation of the new temple was, uh, laid out a few weeks back, very near to that. Uh, 
Yes. Uh, we have a series of temples with domes. In fact, when I visited the place for the first time, I mistook them for mosques. Oh, because really? They, yeah, because they are uh, uh, just uh, bulbous domes which are in the form of mosques and one would not expect that type of you know, construction in ordinarily in a temple. And they were the grants which had been given by the Nawabs of Awadh for the construction of these temples. Right. And you know, the Gangi, Ganga Jamni Tazib gave rise uh, to that sort of a thing. Right. Similarly, right. during Akbar's period at Fatehpur Sikri, uh, I have done a book on that and I have seen that uh, there are a large number of uh, structures where, uh, uh, you know, uh, you cannot make out the chain and bell motif, for example, which is typically of a temple, is being used in religious, Muslim religious structures in Ahmedabad, it is being used in the palaces of Fatehpur Sikri. So that is one of the things uh, which uh, uh, you very kindly gave us information regarding the Deccan, which I can substantiate as far as not yes. is concerned. Uh, yes. Similarly, sir, when you pointed out about the Sharia, uh, you pointed out uh, that you know uh, there were uh, Aziz who were you know, uh, giving decisions as far as the Hindu cases were concerned. Right. You know, a long time back when I was going through uh, certain documents which are in National Archives in Delhi, uh, you know, uh, they are known as Kambe documents. Right. There are document after document where there are certain things which really amazed us when we saw it. For example, uh, the concept of Meher. Mila. The Hindu women getting mehr, which is we consider to be Islamic. Yeah. Secondly, uh, what uh, amazed me was the fact that uh, there were cases where the Hindus were the litigants. They went to the Qazi and the Qazi called that I do not know this rule, what is there in the Hindu law. So, uh, you know, a sahib shara would be called. A man knowing the law, Sharia. Here the Sharia term was not being applied to the Islamic law. The term Shara was being applied in these documents for the law of the Hindus themselves. I'll give you an example where there was a woman who had converted to Islam, wanted the property uh, from her dead father and the pundits ruled when the Qazi called the pundits Qazi said, sahib shara should be called. What is there in the Shariat of the Hindus? And the, uh, the Pandit told that because she has converted, she cannot get a share. And the Qazi then said that the uh, Shara says and the, uh, the, 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 the sahib shara tells me that uh, the, the property cannot be handed over to the uh, Hindu woman. So in fact, uh, by uh, you know, uh, it's by 17th or 18th century in Gujarat, and now you tell me about the Deccan, the even the law which was being applied uh, over the masses, the civilian cases at least, it was a common law uh, which was being implemented. Thank you, sir, for highlighting that aspect. And uh, uh, dear viewers, uh, before uh, we, we take uh, uh, you know uh, leave from you. Let me right. remind you that uh, this November, uh, we are uh, going to have two sessions per week. One on Fridays and the other we would continue on the Sundays. We know that uh, uh, we are uh, dealing with shared past. So for shared past, we have uh, topics like what we discussed today. Next Sunday, we would be having Another very important and well-known uh, historian, Professor Catherine Asher, she will be there, followed by uh, Dr. Uh, Schofield, who would be uh, amongst us and giving a lecture. Then on Fridays, we are starting a new series, which I hope would continue up till March. And that would be on the sources for the study of medieval Indian history. And that we would be starting from 4th of June, of, of, from 4th of November onwards. And I have requested my uh, senior, my colleague, 
who recently retired, Professor Jabir Raza, Professor Sayyid Jabir Raza, who has done work on the Ghaznavides. He has, uh, you know, in, in fact, uh, he is one of the last who is working on Ghaznavides as far as India is concerned. I don't know, uh, Professor Eaton would uh, be better knowing whether in Europe or in America, there is somebody else who is doing work on that. Here in India, there is paucity uh, of anyone working on uh, the Ghaznavide period. Javid Raza Sahib has worked. So he will be discussing the Ghaznavide sources and what type of information they provide regarding the Indian subcontinent. With yeah. these words, uh, I once again thank uh, Professor uh, Eaton. Uh, it was uh, excellent uh, uh, talking to you, excellent uh, hearing you. I wish we could continue. And before I hand over the mic to Shagufta, uh, let me request Professor Eaton live. I mean, I, I and Shagufta have decided that after this meeting, we would be requesting you, but I would request you publicly. We want you for a few more lectures. Sir. Absolutely. Uh, in this series, series which we are going to start on uh, the sources, uh, I would request that if you could talk about the sources for the Bijapur and Golconda or Deccan sources, whatever you uh, think about, uh, sure. uh, we, we can have that lecture, not immediately, but sometime in January or February. And apart from that, uh, we I would be personally interested because I said so when we were starting this program sure. that somehow I like your article and your book on uh, you know temple destruction because that is one of the weapons uh, which uh, becomes very handy for us when certain people make ignorant comments. Yes. There is one former vice chancellor of Aligarh, uh, Lieutenant General Zamiruddin Shah. Right. Uh, you know, he was asking me about uh, this issue. He was writing some article on the destruction of temples and uh. he wanted my opinion. I said, no, sir, I cannot give any opinion on that. I will just, I won't even give you uh, Richard Eaton's book because after all, you are not a historian. I just sent him the uh, two part, you know, frontline essay of yours uh -huh. and that was uh, used by him in a very excellent manner. Uh -huh. uh, so I would uh, request you to uh, be with us and give a lecture on that as well. Shagufta, please. Yes, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, I, it would be a great pleasure to return uh, and, and join you and your colleagues at any time that you wish. Um, I, I, I would like to say one last thing. Your, 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 your discussion of Akazis and law uh, reminds me that there's a new book, which is, I have not yet read it yet, but I'm, I'm going to read it, uh, by uh, Nandini Chatterjee, who has written about the Sharia and its use by Ghazis at the, at the local level, using especially documents from Mawa. And, okay. uh, and she is the one who is, uh, I think, really kind of a pioneer in looking at how law was actually adjudicated. And as we all know, it was, again, the British in the 18th century who came along and, and said that there's going to be Muslim law for Muslims, Hindu law for Hindus. And the Muslim Muslim law was made by them. Yeah, but but yeah. But, if, but under, especially under Aurangzeb, who yeah. qualified all this, the, the, the Fatawati Alamgiri, uh, yeah, yeah. was an attempt to establish a uniform code for the whole country, Hindus and Muslims. Yeah. Mm. And it was actually used that way. So uh, look so be on the lookout for the, this new book by Nandini, Nandini Chatterjee uh, on, right. on law. But but anyway, I would be delighted to join you again. Uh, please let me know what your schedule looks like, and I, I'm sure that we can arrange sometime. Thank you. In the meanwhile, absolutely I want to thank wonderful. You thank you both for such a wonderful thing. So, dear friends, um, uh, Professor Eaton's wonderful new book, which is thoroughly grounded in the latest research, tells this extraordinary story with originality, and it is an accessible language.
So the book brilliantly elaborates the complex encounter between India's Sanskrit culture, which continued to flourish and grow throughout this period, and the Persian culture, which helped shape the Delhi Sultanate, the Mughal Empire, and a host of regional states, and made India what it is today. Thank you so much, Professor. One last word I want to say to my students who are listening to me, or are watching this program, or are reading Medieval India, जो, जो काम आज से कुछ साल पहले तक एनसीआरटी की टेक्स्ट बुक्स करती थी जो आर एस शर्मा सतीश चंद्रा बिपन चंद्रा अगर आपको एक्चुअली इंडियन हिस्ट्री समझना होती थी तो आप इन पतली पतली एनसीआरटी सीरीज नाउ सतीश चंद्रा इज अवेलेबल इन अ मच थिकर फॉर्म सिमिलरली आर एस शर्मा इज ऑल्सो देयर बिपन चंद्रा इज देयर बट मेरा सजेशन ये है कि जो ये आजकल जो मसलन रिचर्ड ईटन साहब की जो लिखी हुई किताब है इरफान हबीब की जो मेडिवल इंडिया एनबीटी की है बड़ी पतली सी है या खास तौर से आई मीन आई विश के अनिल उद्रे साहब जिंदा होते आई वुड हैव एक्चुअली लव टू कॉल हिम ओवर टू दिस प्रोग्राम अनफॉर्चुनेटली एन अनटाइमली डेथ ऑफ इस टू प्लेस हिज बुक इज एक्सेलेंट इफ इफ यू वॉन्ट टू अंडरस्टैंड सल्तनत हिस्ट्री ऑफ द मिडेबल पीरियड उसमें उन्होंने अनलाइक जो कॉम्प्रिहेंसिव हिस्ट्री ऑफ इंडिया वॉल्यूम फाइव लिखी गई है अनलाइक दैट उसमें तकरीबन हर एस्पेक्ट उन्होंने सोसाइटी के टेक्नोलॉजी इकोनॉमी पॉलिटी आर्किटेक्चर आर्ट कल्चर दे हैव टेकन हीज टेकन एवरी थिंग अनफॉर्चुनेटली वो ज्यादा पॉपुलर नहीं हो पा रही हालांकि उसे दो साल तीन साल हो चुके हैं आई अर्ज माय स्टूडेंट के इन तीन किताबों को अगर आपने पढ़ लिया ईटन की इरफान हबीब की और अनिरुद्ध रे की आपको किसी और की जरूरत नहीं पड़ेगी अगर जरूरत पड़ रही है आर्ट एंड आर्किटेक्चर में तो जो एक किताब जो मैंने एक चौथी जिक्र किया था जो इंडिया बिफोर यूरोप फॉर आर्ट एंड आर्किटेक्चर एक्सेलेंट अकाउंट ऑफ दैट इज बुक फॉर लिविंग आप एक्सपर्ट्स बन जाएंगे किसी से भी आर्गुमेंट कर सकेंगे ये पढ़ लीजिएगा थैंक यू वेरी मच वाओ ओके थैंक यू सो मच प्रोफेसर फॉर शेयरिंग योर वंडरफुल इनसाइट्स एंड पॉइंटिंग आउट द द लेसन यू नो व्हाट इज इंपॉर्टेंट टू अस um is that this composite culture holds out to all of us in this time and age this message really resonates deeply with all of us at asha and ganga jabni i want to thank you both and i want to announce this that next sunday in the same series on 8th of november at 8 pm india time we have professor katherine asher of university of minnesota and sir ne unki kitab ke bare mein already mention kar diya hai to aap logo ko topic jo padhaya jayega ya jo uske bare mein share karengi wo topic wo hai the patronage of nobility under akbar तो इस टॉपिक के बारे में हम लोग बातचीत करेंगे अगले संडे को आठ बजे और दिस हैज बीन वन ऑफ द मोस्ट अमेजिंग सेशंस आई विश आई हैड प्रोफेसर लाइक यू एंड आई नो दैट पॉसिबली द बेस्ट आउटकम ऑफ कोविड हैज बीन दिस यू नो पब्लिक डिस्कशंस आई थिंक दैट्स दैट्स वन ऑफ द बेस्ट गिफ्ट्स दैट कोविड कुड हैव गिवन अस वाह Thank you thank you all again thanks for a great thank pleasure thank you thank you thank you so much professor eaton thank you so much professor rizvi all of you have a great night and professor eaton have a great day ahead great sunday for you thank, thank you so you. much for joining us thank you, thank you. good night all right all right bye bye